Hi, Father Ian Van Heusen here. I'm here with Rob Agnelli, who many of you guys have met before, and Patrick Ginty, who's a little bit new to our group today. We're going to be having a conversation about evangelization, uh, the heart of evangelization. Before we jump in too much, Patrick, and I, I should have probably prompted you with this before, can you introduce yourself a little bit, who you are, what you do, and things like that? Sure. My name is Patrick Ginty, and I'm the director of faith formation uh, for here, the Diocese of Raleigh. So that means I'm kind of over catechesis, youth ministry, um, Hispanic ministry, mm -hmm. uh, and anything else that comes up in the middle. Mostly working with our parish leaders throughout the diocese to try and help them in their mission to you know, pro proclaim Christ and teach our Catholic faith. I'm in about 97 parishes. So of course I don't do all of that myself. I have a team of people uh, with me to help in the specific areas, but that's basically what I do. Heck yeah. Glad to have you, man. It's good to be here, man. So let's jump in with a quote from Deus Caritas S, which I think really gets at the heart. One of the things I think it's good to visit from time to time is that in future conversations, we'll get into the weeds and we'll kind of discuss things in depth more. But it's to start off with, like, what is the core? What is the heart of evangelization? And I think this quote, which many of us have heard before, but it's a good one to remind ourselves of from time to time, from Pope Benedict Deus Caritas S, God is Love, which is, being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but an encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. Who wants to start us off with that? What are some of your thoughts? We'll have to figure out how we... So I was watching, actually watching a podcast, that was about probably about six or eight months ago with Jordan Peterson. I don't know if either one of you guys saw this. Big fan. Uh, and he was talking about Jesus, mm -hmm. right? He, he yeah. was talking about what amounted to this, this sort of intellectual conversion he had, that he was pretty sure Jesus was who he said he was, right? And, and you can sense it, and I think at a certain point he even starts crying about it, like the tears are flowing. But he's, he's talking about Jesus in the past tense, so he's not there yet, right? He's not, he's not acting as if, you know, the story of the resurrection, that Jesus is still alive today, and, and, and you can have an encounter with him. And so I, I think there's always that little bit of transition for all of us in our spiritual life, where we realize that Jesus, yes, he was a historical figure, and like the resurrection really happened and, and all of those things. But then you get to this certain point where you realize that, oh no, he, he's actually still alive and I can have this encounter with him mm -hmm. like one-on-one -on -one right here, right now. And to me, that's, that's where it transforms, right? I think about like my favorite line from scripture is where, where uh, St. Paul talks about in Galatians, he says, the son of God died for me, right? Like he makes it about him rather than just like the son of God died for us. Yeah. Right, and so that movement from us to me is at the heart of that quote. Heck yeah, and I think it, it's interesting. You mentioned that that sense of that Christ, God is living, Christ is a, is is present to us, and I I think that gets at the idea that we're one of the things we were talking about with catechesis and formation is sometimes people are interested in trivia, right? So like mm -hmm. I could have a fascination with the Roman Empire and military formations. And so I could talk, hypothetically talk at length about it and really be fascinated by it. But somebody else might be like, well, I'm not interested in that, so it doesn't interest me. So sometimes when we teach catechesis or we teach about the faith, but it's not grounded in an encounter with Christ or that this encounter is the most important thing, mm -hmm. um, it can become like trivia in a certain regard. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Brought to mind... Uh a sermon I'd heard recently uh, by Archbishop Sheen, uh, one of my favorites, and it was called The Divine Invasion. And he talked about how, you know, in a certain sense, our faith, supernatural faith, comes to us from without. And it's almost like because of our wounded human nature, our position towards God is one of resistance. It's like, nope, not interested, don't come in. And the encounter with Christ is literally somehow, and it's mysterious how it happens, somehow we stop resisting. Somehow the Lord finds a crack, you know, and he's able to enter in and flood our heart, you know, and that's, that's what we mean by the encounter with Christ, you know. Um, and from that flows evangelization, you know, because, you know, scriptures say, uh, the mouth speaks of what the heart is full of, 
right? And I think that's one of the major problems that I find. Uh, it's almost like uh, within the church, we're forcing evangelization. Like, you have to do this. You have to do, like, just go out there and share your story and do this. And it's like, the people's hearts aren't full of Jesus Christ yet, right? I almost see uh, evangelization as an overflow. It's like we've let Christ into our hearts so much. He's filled us so much, but we can't but share the good news with other people. It, we, we, even if you tried to stop me, you couldn't because I'm going to proclaim him and I'm going to speak about him. Um, and I almost think that crack that opens, I'm hoping this is right, you know, something I haven't thought of, it's something that popped in my mind right now. I'm all, I think that crack that happens where we allow God in is a sense of our need for him, right? And that's the difference between, I think, what a lot of the preaching that's going on right now. It's like, wouldn't it be great if Jesus was a part of your life? And most people say, no, I'm fine without him. Thanks. You know, it's not until the soul says, you know, that poverty of spirit, I need Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Without him, you know, uh, my life is meaningless and, and I won't attain eternal life. You know, it's not until your heart is full of that need so that he can enter into that place. And then comes the overflow of evangelization because you can talk, Jesus Christ died for me. And you really understand it, and you really mean it. And you see people like, man, he really thinks, you know, he really believes it. Yeah, so. I think too the, the aspect like Patrick brings up about news, right? Like we're we're in a culture where we're inundated with news, right? And we miss the import of what that really what it means in the sense of evangelization, and in the fact that like it's tied to an event, right, that changed the world forever, mm. right? No matter what, no matter you know. If you want to get rid of AD and use whatever, you know, common error, whatever you want to do, that still event changes everything. And, and it's when that encounter with that I have that it, it changes my world too. So, so the world is different whether I'm, I'm a part of the direction it's going or not. But if I see it as a news event, right? Like think about like all three of us could probably say, oh, yeah, I remember exactly the moment when uh, the, the, the tower, the first tower got hit, right? Yeah. 9-11. And I knew at that moment the world was going to be forever different. Yeah. Right. And, and and not just the world out there, but my life too, in some ways. Right. And so, so when we say something is good news, like that event is meant to change, is meant to change the world forever and change my world. And, and so we, we have to, in a certain sense, when we proclaim that we have to proclaim it like that, yeah. right? Like, like this is totally life altering. And, and this is where like the charisma is really important, right? Because it, that gets in the personal nature of like what it means to me and what it did to me and not just the sense of like, it's just this abstract God fact or something. So I like the word news. You know, we, we talk about the good news, you know, and the preaching of the kerygma. I do think that it's like we, t we focus a lot on the good news, but what I've found in a lot of our teaching and a lot of our preaching is they don't understand the good news or proclaim the good news correctly because they haven't talked about the bad news yet. Yeah. Right? It's like that's the second step in the charisma. It's like God created us out of love for us and to share in his divine life, to share in his love. It's like we lost that through sin. That's the bad news and it's horrible, you know, and we can't repair that by so ourselves. I think probably the majority of people, honestly, like the, the notion of the charisma, it's probably, you started it. Let's go through it a little bit because the yeah. majority of people probably listening are like, you know, I've heard that term, but I don't really know what it is, right? So you said mm -hmm. the first and second step. Like keep going. Yeah, and I've seen uh, different iterations of it. So first step, we were created for God to, to live our life in Him and Him in us. The second thing, we lost that through sin, not just original sin, but through our personal sin as well. Um, and we can't repair that. So there's, there's this unreachable you know, goal that's the reason for our existence, our purpose of our life. Uh, God's response to that is His Son, Jesus Christ. You know, that Jesus Christ, the God-man, uh, through the sacrifice on the, on the cross, through his death and resurrection, was able to repair what we couldn't repair. Um, and no, so now fellowship with the Father is offered to us in Jesus Christ, in, in our adopted sonship through baptism and the sacraments and the grace that flows from that. And then the fourth step, at, at least the way I iterate it, is and now it's up to you to accept that. Now it's up to you to say yes, again, that divine invasion, right? Like opening up your heart and saying, okay, yes, I believe in that. I need him. I need to be saved from my sins. And so I say yes to him. But I had on a fifth one as well. And 
The fifth part of that is we do that through the Holy Church that he has established and through the sacraments. Mm -hmm. And that's not a minor part. You know, that's not a small part. Uh, because again, it's through baptism that we're made adopted sons. It's through the sacrament of reconciliation that once we fall, we've been reconciled to him. It's through Holy Communion that our bond and baptism is strengthened and all the rest of the sacraments. That's at least how I, and, and when I teach it, I try to have them do one, two, three, four, five. And then you can express it in any way you want as long as you hit those points. Yeah, I think so. We've, we've hit on a few things, kind of uh, summarizing a little bit. So we talked about the fact that like the Christ event, Christ coming is something that currently transforms us, that's present. Recognizing our need for God, recognizing a sense of proclaiming the kerygma. And, and I think typically, I think what we'd want to is, you, we've talked about this a lot, Patrick. I think I've talked about it with you, with Rob as well. Is that all of our all of our evangelization efforts are to lead people to the moment where the kerygma is proclaimed to them, that, that 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 they're taught the saving action of Christ, and they make a definitive choice for Christ. They encounter Christ and they decide to to live that way. And I think that's at the heart of Pope Benedict's quote is, and when you start to talk about how is everything around the parish structured? So I, I, I give the example with um, ECU Newman, is our socials and our outreaches are to lead people to the moment where we can proclaim the kerygma to them and they can encounter Christ. Um, our, all, of, all of that, all of our activity is oriented around that. And then after that, the life, living the life of a disciple. Um, and I think it's interesting that our focused missionaries talk about it when they're, they're doing evangelization is they have a definitive moment where they kind of proclaim the kerygma to somebody and they kind of lay it out for them. And I think sometimes people, we miss that in the church. Um, I'm not sure if I have a question based on that. That's all right. Can I jump things. in yeah. and then maybe you can follow up? You have a lot of experience with this in your ministry. I call this, again, uh, you know, one of my great loves is philosophy, and one of my uh, secret loves is existential philosophy, uh, but, you know, with a, a Christian twist. Um, and so I see that moment of presenting the kerygma as what I call, like, the existential dilemma. And I really do feel like the question of Jesus Christ is the ultimate existential dilemma. You know, it's not just, like, facing death or facing life, or, uh, but it's, like, Jesus Christ, yes or no. Um, and I do think, and that's why I thought of this, I think within the church we do a really poor job at creating those existential moments. Not only that, but we almost purposefully avoid them. I hear people all the time, well, we don't wanna, we don't wanna get anyone, you know, uh, we don't wanna disturb them in any way. We wouldn't want people to feel as though, you know, we're pressuring them or, and it's like, it's almost like we wanna keep them so comfortable that they'll never actually have to enter into this dilemma that hopefully they'll just accept Christ in some way and somehow, but we're not actually creating the moment where that might actually happen. Yeah. I, go yeah go, well, in part of it, I was just going to add, it's going to be uncomfortable. Like the, it has to be uncomfortable. That's the, you know, that's the existential angst, you know, that you feel about it, you know, because it is uncomfortable because it's like, I'm not independent. I can't save myself. I can't do this. I'm spiritually bankrupt and I have to go before the judge you know, I have to say, I've made such a mess out of my life that you have to get me out of here. And there's, yeah, there's all, all of that. It's like, it's horrible. And you, don't, you, don't, you yeah. don't lead with that, but I mean, because that'd be like, you know, that'd be uncomfortable to start with that. But that, that, has, that conversation has to happen at some point. Yeah, and you'd, you'd want to rely on the Holy Spirit to, to try and like allow you that moment, you know, like, uh, but once he prompts you, like, don't be afraid to do it. Yeah, I think I, I like the term existential better than what I use, like, when I'm working, especially young men, I like to do this. I am trying to move them to a crisis point, right? Mm. Like, and, I'm, and, and the temptation always, I mean, this is where your example is good. The temptation always for me is to solve their crisis point. But what I want, I want them to sit in the uncomfortableness of that crisis point so that they're forced to make a choice for or against Christ, right? And so, um, so when, often when I, when I use that term like crisis point, people are like, uh, so maybe I should start using existential. But, but the point is, right, that... that until you're actually, you get to like step two of the kerygma where you realize like something's not right. Like it shouldn't be this way. And, and you have a choice then, right? Like just like Adam and Eve had, right? Like God never left them without hope, 
right? What, like, what's the first thing that happens? We tell them, well, I'm going to send a, a, a Redeemer and his mother. Like, tells them immediately, never without hope, right? And so you have to, you have to un, make them uncomfortable enough that they realize something is not right. Um, and you're right, you can't do that by preaching. But, you know, in a certain sense, like when I'm, when I'm working with someone, I kind of I kind of hoping God will will create a little crisis uh, in their life so that they're forced to go wait something's not right. And I, f- I found that with preaching with teaching is it's interesting that um, and I, the one of the questions is um, when I'm challenging it's like a challenge to people when you're challenging them and trying to help them to grow is in the long run it's good for somebody and these things are good to challenge and help them to grow. But it is profoundly uncomfortable. But the irony, of course, is that growth comes from being uncomfortable and pushing yourself, right? And in a certain regard, other aspects of life have this dimension of challenging and helping somebody to grow. Like coaches, you know, they, they try to make your life uncomfortable and try to push you. But we've abandoned that sometimes within the church. Um, of, of course, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think uh, we particularly live in a society where you know, for the most part, we're almost immune from these existential dilemmas. One, because of the amount of distractions that we have, you know, and the opulent lifestyle. And I do think that opulence as well, it's like, you know, Jesus says, it's very difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, look at the Ivan, you know, look at a camel. That's all that, of us right now, right? Yeah. We're all rich men. We are all rich men now. And it's no wonder that the gospel is spreading to the places of the world where they're constantly living in what? In a state of need, in a state of like, like I need other people, I, I'm going without. And it's like, I think there's, there is a connection on just your, the temporal level in which if I'm completely independent and I can figure out my whole life by myself and I don't actually need anyone and I'm in control of everything, it's very hard then on a spiritual level to be able to say like, I need God in a deep, existential way you know otherwise i'm completely lost it's almost like goes against everything that we're living which is why oftentimes evangelization is um preceded by some dramatic life change the loss of a child the loss of health the possibility of death all of these things which the irony is of course is like I, like one one of the time one of the questions i get a lot in spiritual direction and things is why did god allow for this bad thing to happen um, like I had one person who was disturbed by bad dreams and they felt like there was some demonic activity and they were talking to me and they said, Father, why uh, do you think God allowed for these bad things? I said, well, would you be here talking to a priest? Would you be open to go to confession if it wasn't because of this crisis? And that's when like the light bulb went off and they're like, I wouldn't be talking to you. I was fine and happy before this came into my life. Which I think one of the so one of the theological questions, uh, the, the the De Lubac controversy, and it, it's a it's a I think we can tie this in a little bit, is one of the, the the questions is can we be happy without Jesus Christ, and this is a deep theological question, and that's the the nature of grace debate and this question of, and there is a sense I would hold a more Thomistic position, there is a sense that people can have a certain kind of happiness, without Christ but it's a fleeting happiness and a happiness in this world. And I think part of it is we have to help them to recognize that the deeper form of happiness comes through Jesus Christ and how these other limited forms of happiness will ultimately fall short, won't be there for them in the long run. Sure, I think it's, you know, that that happiness that Christ gives us, obviously he says, you know, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, a, a peace that the world cannot give, it doesn't even understand. You know, I think Aquinas is definitely, you know, uh, looking, he's, he has the Aristotelian influence of the eudaimonia, you know, the kind of like the balance between all things. Um, and that is definitely, it's attainable in life without God. Absolutely. It's just like certain natural virtues are attainable without God. You know, I've seen very naturally virtuous people that don't seem to have any spiritual or religious life. Um, but happiness you know, as much as you work at it, and if you were to get that perfect eudaimon, Aristotelian, you know, Thomistic type of virtue equilibrium in your life, like that, it can be taken away from you. Like that, the, the, the death of a family member, war, like what we're experiencing right now, 
uh, a whole host of things. You know, it's, it's fleeting, it, it's not lasting, um, and it's not that you can't dedicate a certain amount of your life to, you know, pursuing that. You know, and I think there is a certain natural joy and, and probably a disposition towards God that comes from it, but it's not what God created us for. Well, and that's why he wounds us with original sin, right? Like, he could have just left nature alone, right? Like, but that woundedness we carry around is the constant reminder that that happiness is, even if you could, like, even if you can become perfectly virtuous, you're never going to be happy. Like, you're never going to truly be happy. And, and I think that's piggybacking on what you said earlier, I think is really important is our culture's tendency to embrace our brokenness, right? And, and it's really difficult to reach someone when, when they've embraced their brokenness, right? I mean, the, the example I can think of immediately is like same-sex attraction, right? Like, there, people are, there, when you normalize something, when it, you know, it's something that, that you, you rob the cross of its power, right? And so um, that, that to me is one of the biggest obstacles where they, you, something's clearly amiss in someone and we just pat them on the back and go, that's okay. You know, you, you should accept that. No, you should take it to the foot of the cross and let Jesus destroy it, yeah. right? And, and that he has the power to do that, right? It's, I mean, you know, it's, and if we keep doing that, again, you squeeze Jesus, like, why do I need Jesus? Like, I can embrace my own brokenness. Uh, what do I need him for? I think you hit on a point, which is, so getting back to this existential dilemma, this question of happiness, where you talked about somebody normalized something within them that needs healing, something that needs to be redeemed and, and, and grow from. But it's a normalization from the outside is what I'm really talking about. Yeah. Because that person's still walking around going, something's not right. Absolutely. Something's not right. Yeah. Completely right. broken And then you inside. tell them that and they're like, well, some, something's not, I still think something's not right. And then you create this terrible situation for them. And, and I'll them. say so much so that you're seeing this, especially in the area of sexuality, it's becoming a crime to even suggest that there might be wrong with somebody because it's so fragile. It's such a house of cards that the minute you start to poke at it, the whole thing falls apart. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I talked about this with somebody is, uh, 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 I was talking with somebody, didn't, the conversation didn't go well, but I still, I still think it was a good. <laughs> they usually don't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, if it's around that topic, I'm not surprised. <laughs> but I thought about it with happiness is, so like my happiness as a priest or my happiness in my vocation is, is more affected by like my immediate circumstances. Do I have friends? Do I feel balanced? Am I connected to the Lord? And if I read an article, for example, that said, because I'm celibate, because I'm a priest, I'm a weirdo, I'm disordered, and I'm going to go crazy. I would look at it and I would kind of be like, huh, not exactly my life. Like, I'm not so fragile. It's not such a house of cards. It doesn't cards. correspond to your experience. Yeah, like, I wouldn't have an existential crisis and say, I need to make sure this person never writes another article about um, being celibate. It's going to make you crazy. I would, never, I would never have that experience. But it's funny because right now in society, what you kind of reach on is, if I write that article on, uh, on same-sex attraction and it triggers somebody, then I've done them a great harm. But it's, yeah... It's interesting how that. Yeah, and in ministry, it's like we're constantly avoiding, we're constantly avoiding uh, that experience within people. It's like we don't don't touch on this subject because you know it's going to get people riled up, and it's like, yeah, yeah, like that's that's kind of what we want to do, because we are in such again a malaise right now. We're in such a fog. And it is darkness. You know, the Gospel of John, Jesus is constantly talking about darkness. You know, and that, that outside affirmation or the you know, embracing sin is specifically when the, the Gospel says you know, the light came into the world and the world rejected it because their deeds were evil. They preferred the darkness to the light. Mm -hmm. you know? And the best thing that could possibly happen is that someone is shaken up, someone is jarred, and they begin to actually think on their life. Because for the most part, everything in society right now is just let's keep this as comfortable and moving, moving forward as comfortably as possible. You know, even recently, I, with this whole, you know, with, with the war and with Ukraine, you know, the president said something to the effect of, you know, you know we're going to help them out, but we're going to make sure that your life stays as comfortable as possible, that gas prices are down and everything else is like, this whole thing is like, don't worry, we're going to keep you in this comfort. COVID, I felt like 
the whole thing. The reason that people didn't rise up, I think, and, and you know, assert their human rights, especially in the area of religion and everything else, it's like, we were just too darn comfortable. It's like, you can sit at but, home. But we weren't, I mean, the, the studies show uh -huh. mental health are plummeted. So the irony is, the irony is, is that comfort does not lead to... Oh yeah, it wasn't good for us. Wasn't good, it's not good for you. Well, you know? and Patrick's touching on a really important point where, you know, in the past, Christians would think comfort was our enemy, right? Mm. And, and, I mean, again, not to be like masochistic or something like, but the point is, right, like, for St. Francis to say, I was like, I, I'm best when I'm not well. Like when something is a little bit off, Again, going back to the whole reminder, right, that, that this is not my final destination. Like, despite all of the, the nice things and the, I can order all this stuff online, why do I need to go out of the house? Like, all of those things, like, comfort, we, in a certain sense, we should be very wary of comfort because of what it does to us. And so, reading, going back to the quote by Saint, ben, uh, not Saint, Pope Benedict. Almost. Almost. It's coming, man. It's coming, yeah. <laughs> Pope Benedict the Sixteenth is, this encounter with Christ. So the way people misunderstand this quote of encountering Christ and this definitive encounter with Christ, that's the heart of Christianity, is that most people view this as a, a, an, a positive thing in the sense of it'll make me feel better. There might be truth in it. It might set you free. It might make you feel better. But it also can be profoundly uncomfortable at the same time. Now, I think piggybacking on this, one of the things that... Um, St. John of the Cross talks about, I think it's the end of the dark, dark night of the soul, uh, the dark night of the soul, that work, is he talks about ascending and descending. And he talks about that as we grow in our relationship with life at the heights of holiness, but I think this gets at the, the, the encounter with Christ in its totality. There's the glory and there's the beauty and the grandeur of who God is, but then there's the sinfulness and the weakness and the disorder that is us. And so the heights of holiness is encountering that beauty, that incredible, that glory, and then also encountering paradoxically our sinfulness and our weakness. And so I think with the encounter with Christ, it's both of those things. God loves us, He forgives us, He sets us free, and that's awesome and that's beautiful. But I am sinful, prone to error, I've done terrible things, maybe some of us more so than other, I've done definitely some terrible things. And so that's, we have to recognize our sinfulness and God's glory at the same time. Yeah, and there's, like, within evangelization, you'll hear, like, oh, we can't talk about sin. You know, why? Um, well, if you dwell on sin too much, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's psych psychologically disturbing, you know, and you can become a really dark person. And I would say to that, like, yeah, you're, that's actually probably right. If you don't have a simultaneous trust and dependence in, in Jesus Christ, right? It's so it's like the two increase at the same time. My knowledge, you'll hear the saints say, like, I'm the greatest sinner of all. It's like, yeah, they actually believe that. But at the same time, they were completely balanced um, and they didn't fall into despair. In fact, they showed forth heroic virtue, you know, especially the theological virtues. Why? Because there was a simultaneous trust in God and knowledge that in me, he can do something great. Like for man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So if you just dwell on the sin, if you just look at the negative, then yeah, you'll, you'll probably go crazy, you know? Um, so there has to be, without dwelling on the sin without the encounter with Christ. Right? And, I, and I think you have to dwell on the sin long enough that you become utterly convinced that you are a man of mercy, right? Like th that's what you're really talking about, right? Like I'm trying to have this encounter with God's mercy, Yeah. right? So mercy always has to have the last word. But if uh, I'll never get to mercy without really realizing one that that I'm a sinner and that I have sinned in very real ways, two to know what I'm actually capable of, right? that I'm capable of far worse than I actually have probably even done, right? Um, but in the end, when I, the next step in that process is, but look, like God has been merciful, and so that like in the end, right, like your sins will go with you to heaven, but there'll be stamps of mercy. Right? There'll, there'll be stamps of mercy where the, the angels and the, and the saints will be glorifying God for the mercy he gave you. And that, that to me, like, that is abundantly, uh, that, I mean, that's, that's glory, right? Like, that's, that's what we want, right? To God's to be glorified either way. I think it's a great place to leave off on this. So this encounter with Christ mm -hmm. is an encounter with mercy and forgiveness 
and it leads to an existential dilemma. So thanks for listening to this first one, this heart of evangelization. We're going to be doing some more content on the soul of the apostolate and getting at ministry and evangelization. But thanks for joining for this segment. Have a good day.